Hey, I'm uh, Dr. Rachel Swisser, yeah. and I, uh, as I said, I am a senior uh, research fellow and as well as a lecturer at the National Security Program at the Haifa Center for German and European Studies. My background is actually, I call it multidisciplinary security studies because studies in security, really, really, they have this interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary character. Uh, that means you have to touch sometimes several disciplines in order to discuss or understand um, a topic or a dilemma. And something about the background of this uh, topic, actually it was inspired by the second intifada in Israel when the IDF, a behavioral department launched a call. After that, I met several senior uh, uh, officers and we had several discussions about what I can do in order to possibly understand or propose some kind of a theory or to this topic. And the best thing that happened after several meetings is that actually no one really understood the other. When I say that, it means that it was good because I was not trapped into the conception of what resilience is. Maybe the negative uh, implication of that kind of misunderstanding was that I had to start from scratch. Because when I came to look at the state of the art, it rested mainly on psychology and psychiatric disciplines. And I had a problem, or maybe I was not comfortable with these two uh, main uh, disciplines that actually already dealt and contributed greatly to the concept of military resilience. And then I took some time and I took simply the anatomy of several conflicts. And I took four conflicts. When I say the anatomy, that means no interpretation about events. Just going from, for instance, I have this, uh, the anatomy of the Algerian uh, uh, insurgents. So I had to go from every day, every hour, the orders given, the directives written, what was the in ever that means I went from the empirical actually basis to try to create maybe some conceptual theoretical framework instead of maybe being exposed to what was already written about this topic and then maybe possibly arguing arguing with it or but that was the the the, the setting of the of the, of the inspiration of, on, on this subject. It means your facts and it's four. So it took me something like three months, day and night, to understand what, what, what can we see as a regularity in these different conflicts, different entities. But when we see the one from France, Algeria, to the one to the Palestinian Authority, we can see also that there is a chronology of low intensity conflict. That means what we call war transformation. Okay? So this is the background. Now, it is a purely military is, in terms of what am I going to do right now? Okay? And the oath. I saw these expressions right now in the leaflet you gave me, is normative, as I see it, but it can be very provocative. I mean, after giving the definitions, trying to propose several hypotheses, checking, examining those hypotheses, and then I come with the results. I myself was surprised with the results. I didn't like the results. Okay, I didn't like the results, and I think you will have the same <laughs> experience. Okay, so I'll try to do first time using this. Okay, 
more gentle. <laughs> so I'll give a conceptual framework. It will include, of course, definitions. I don't like definitions unless, unless they bring me back to practical implementation. I mean, just definitions, you will not, it will, I, will, I always see it as something that tries to freeze something, okay? A definition can never be sufficient, especially in the realm of security that we know that we speak about a specific field of study that, for instance, when you take threats, you understand that you are facing a dynamic uh, concept, a subjective concept, a relative concept. That means what kind of defi definitions will be sufficient if I want to sort of define the com complex of the military resilience? Okay, so I will have to do this. Of course, what is a low intensity conflict? We spoke about terrorism and low intensity, intensity conflict is actually a wider spectrum of terrorism because it includes also the dynamicity of terrorism going from a terrorist organization or a non-state actor. I always prefer to use this term. I always prefer to use this term. Going from a non-state actor to a semi-state actor. Okay? And this is what we usually forget. When we say security dynamic, that means terrorism is not a stagnant, okay? phenomena. It has its different stages, its evolution, sometimes allowing you to foresight, to make scenarios on where it is going, and accordingly, possibly, okay, plan a strategy, and possibly try to stick to, uh, to, to, uh, to the connection or linkage between strategy and implementation and decision making. So I think this is, it's a very dynamic spectrum. So after saying that, what is military resilience? Okay, it's also, mm -hmm. and when I will introduce some new hypotheses, the three hypotheses that I saw that were not what I call intrusing hypothesis. It's not about intrusing variables. For instance, how the model of a military army, okay, affects resilience. Why such a connection should be done? It is not a mental one. It is not a psychiatric. It's not a psychological aspect. It's a purely structural, organizational aspect that we should see, okay, and we should investigate the connections between the type of the military model and its impact on senior ranks or regular military ranks. So this is one. The second one is, in this uh, conceptual framework, the warfare strategy. Why I think that warfare strategy affects military resilience, okay? It is not a mental concept. It is not a psychological concept, not merely, okay? So why warfare strategy in a low intensity conflict has such effect? The third one is why the relationship between the political and military ranks affect, have an impact on the military resilience, okay? It's a complete, seems out, complete outside, extrinsic factor. Okay, so why does it have an effect? So I'll, I'll have to, 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 to do and to elaborate these concepts because they are the core of these hypotheses about. And then we get some results. I'm not going to put all the results if you are interested. Of course, I will send them, just some uh, selected, I call them uh, results, yeah. So let's go to low intensity conflict. We always think, I, I know the association is always a tro troubling uh, gap, trap also. We also think terrorism. No, but terrorism can sometimes be a continuation of a full scale warfare. Okay. 
And sometimes it can start as a terrorist, a ter all, all the, 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 the characteristics of as a terrorist activity, going slowly, evolving slowly to a full-scale warfare. For instance, the North, uh, the, uh, the Hezbollah in Israel, okay, is a very good is a very good example. The second one is it combines nonviolent actions such as civil protests, strikes, demonstration, and so and violent actions. So such so all the terms, popular terms, such uprising, guerrilla of uh, terrorism, civil uh, disobedience, and so on can give, you know, can have some common characteristics, but we know that they all possess a political significance. And we talk about it in previous, in the previous panels, that we know that they must have a purpose. Because, for instance, we had the proposal of labeling terrorism as crime, but we know that not each assassin or each killing is necessarily a crime. Okay? We can't say an assassin, assassination is an assassination is killing. No, no. I mean, we know that there are some ramifications, okay, that you should do. Unlike the terrorist attack that you can evaluate it through intentions, capability, and behavior. And it differs greatly from just saying crime. Now, we're all afraid from securitization, but now we know that also this securitization has a political agenda. So why should, we, why should we stick and soften these concepts just for the for normative, uh, normative uh, value? <coughs> okay, no. So I prefer to put all of them, but I acknowledge several similar characteristics they possess, and I acknowledge the dynamicity. Okay? And it's a lot, because when we speak about resilience, it means that we don't have one resilience at all, wherever human behavior is concerned. There is no such a thing. For instance, disasters. You cannot speak about the same resilience in different nations, cultures, entities. Not only that, the same resilience is in different disasters for sites, for instance, okay? Like we always say, Israel is not prepared for earthquakes. But then we say that when you put all these threat evaluation, what you see is the connection between the threat evaluation in terms of the consequences. The consequences of a missile rocket attack are greatly similar <laughs> to an earthquake attack. In many senses, not all of them. Now, what I call when we want to plan in a parsimony way, okay, so you have, you're not going to go to worst case analysis because we have limited resources. So, what you can do is actually make some kind of a net assessment of these threats and try to intervene between the resources and the capabilities you need, okay to handle them or to manage them. Because today we know that threat perception spills to other threat perceptions. And they, 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 there is no sole threat perception. They, most of them are hybrids. So I recommend very much to see this without going into uh, uh, too many ramifications. Now, the forces that participate usually in low intensity conflicts are irregular, who usually do not belong to an organized military, nor are they part of any regular army. And the choice of a certain mode of action is made in accord with the measure of its contribution, contribution to achieving the goals of the conflict. Okay. Uh, second one, yeah. Different motivations with common characteristics. Not, okay, we know they have some comment, but they have, they differ in the motivation. The motivation is a core, I think, is a core characteristic we should take into consideration. So low-intensity conflicts have a political purpose. We all know that the resolution 
is accomplished by change of social awareness. This is why I call it they have psychological warfare. Terrorism strategy is a psychological warfare as a tactical first level in that strategy. You cannot compare it to simple crime or assassination because you speak of a psychological, this is the arena. This is the crime scene. The crime scene is your psyche, okay? The second one, the political considerations are dominant while the military operation is secondary. Even when we talk about terrorism, they are not willing to go with you to some decisive battles. Never, <clears throat> never. The main outcome are those in consciousness while the physical outcomes are secondary. And of course, we speak about enduring conflicts. When we speak about enduring conflicts, it means we have an anatomy going from the onset, the evolution, evolu the, the, the evolution, the maturation stage of a low intensity conflict, and it's a big difference, okay? And then some possibility in its management, which is we are becoming calmer, the conflict management, or if we really are lucky, a conflict resolution. So it's an enduring conflict. And when we speak about an enduring conflict, it's a specific anatomy of a conflict. Now, the management of the conflict is also based on the ability to supervise the intensity of the friction. Okay? And of course, the most challenging aspect, it possesses a basic situation of asymmetry in the power of the opposing side. So asymmetry also is a misleading concept, as I see it. I hope I didn't. Okay. Because when we think about asymmetry, what we, what we, what we know is already the military capability. But it's not. Because asymmetry sometimes works for the good for one side, okay, and for bad for the other. Of course, in military capabilities, we will know that the state actor, okay, has dominance. But in other clusters of, 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 of asymmetry, we will see that the other, the inferior so-called site has his own advantages. So this is why I brought several clusters of asymmetry, okay? There are at least eight clusters that I know and they are very important because if we want to follow the dynamicity of a low intensity conflict, these are actually the guiding lines, okay, to understand that dynamicity. And also it has great implication on legal aspects, these asymmetry components. The first one we know, there is a difference between a state actor and non-state actor in the basic national data. We know that. Okay, it includes the territory, the population, the resources, the power and economic ability and so on. The second cluster of asymmetry is in the type of perception and interpretations. Actually, I see it as a leading asymmetry uh, component because if we go into learning the opponent, okay, how do we learn each other when we are, when we have, when you have two opponents? This is a very critical one because what we see is that learning, okay, gets better the more the conflict goes to its, uh, uh, reduces its symmetry. Okay, I'll leave it right now. Now, asymmetry in the, day, in, the, in, the, in the data of status that support international contacts and so on. Technology, of course. The amount of possible damage to the home front is a value and it differs greatly. Sometimes the inferior has an advantage and sometimes the state actor has its advantage. And the other one, the human, the personal the group military abilities and qualities. I'm not sure that state actors have the monopoly on this. Okay, I'm really not sure about this kind of asymmetry. 
So I think it's it, it, it's stronger in the other side. Uh, I don't know. You know, like the, as, as, now why it is it a challenge? Why I call it a challenge? Because we have new dynamic problems for political and military decision makers. Okay, they deal both with okay and adapt themselves to the mobility of the enemy, who is actually inferior. Okay, in warfare power because a state actor actually has tremendous power. But the power usually becomes irrelevant, okay? And we have some cases, I could say that since 2006, Israel, for instance, has invested a great deal in tailored technology specific to different zones, okay? To the Hamas, Aza Gaza zones, and to the Lebanon zones. But I call them ad hoc developments. But in general, in general, we know that most of the conventional military capabilities when you come to manage a low intensity conflict are irrelevant. What we call the power of the weakness, the power of the inferior. Now, the combination of relatively simple armaments, okay, and technologies that have a media impact is also a challenge. Okay, the framework of strategy directed by cultural principles opposed to Western values are at the basis of the problem of asymmetry. Now, when I use low intensity conflict in practical terms, I'm actually referring to how Western democracies conduct these types of conflicts, except for the Chechen uh, war, the two rounds, which I will relate, and it was Yeltsin. It was very interesting what Yeltsin has done, because I bring Russia, okay, which is not a democratic uh, country, but we see that the conditions of the scene, the conditions <laughs> of Grozny, has forced upon Russia the use of conducting a military resilience like France and some other. It was a very rough battle, but they had two rounds. And I will make some comments on the two rounds when we come to see exactly the results. Now, unlike classical large-scale warfare, which is actually the natural duty of most armies, low-intensity conflict represents a different warfare okay, reality beginning in the general rules of using force, unique operational perception in a unique arena, and ending with problems of cohesion and motivation, particular to this situation. So, it is a challenge. As I said, resilience, should always be diagnosed. You should always diagnose it, whom I'm talking about, what I'm talking, what is the specific situation, who, okay? It's like exactly standing in front of a medical doctor. I believe in the world, in the word differential diagnosis. I believe in it. But it means resilience is a different challenge in different situations, meaning a full scale war places unique demands on the resilience of the military organization and routine times has their own demands on resilience. That means we cannot speak about resilience in routine times as we speak about resilience when you are conducting a full scale warfare. The same goes for low intensity conflict. Low intensity conflicts needs its ramification. What do I mean by military resilience in a specific situation like, like uh, conducting a, a, a low intensity conflict? We cannot speak generally and give clusters, plenty of clusters. They sound really good because in practice, it's a tremendous load and, and, and always unreachable. 
So the objective of warfare, training framework of regular army, does correspond with the rules of the game of battlefields between state actors and regular armies. We know that. However, to fighters of irregular military organizations, the very concept of a front, okay, is not applicable. Yes, please. May I just interject um, and ask you to define resilience? Well, I'm going to do it. It is a problem that I'm going to invest in it, really. I did. Okay. I did invest in it. I'm just trying right now to, to uh, maybe just to elaborate the challenge. Okay. Because then it justify why do I need to be very accurate if I want to, to, to say or to analyze, to assess the military resilience of a military corpus when it conducts such a thing. And I want to take that definition into a very practical term. Okay, this is why. And, and it's, of course, we must define it. In this case, we have to define it. Uh, okay, so it brings, I will go, of course, the constraints of fighting terror to a great extent, uh, challenge the abilities that emanate from the classical mission of an army. So it is. Uh, and now I come to the state of the art, and I call it, it's more of a critical survey, okay? Because what I saw is this. I saw psychology, of course, organizational, of course, the organizational paradigm on military, military resilience, uh, the sociological paradigm on military resilience, the psychiatric paradigm on military, they all have a definition. They all have definitions, but the problem was they all have different definition of one concept, post-traumatic stress disorder. That means they all focus on this concept, everyone within his disciplinary tools, try to understand the content, okay, or the context also, of one concept, post-traumatic stress disorder, everywhere. That means, what I saw is in terms of theory, when you do linkages, okay, you have a similar terms, that means tensions and pressures all over, all of them, all over them. So what does, for instance, posed by the military? Environment, uh, military operation, convent. Then you have the level of analysis. Now I'm trying to you know, to tell you about the levels of the analytical process. So when you go to the linkages between this, these different paradigms, you see it's the same concept. Once again, we speak about pressures, yes. We speak about strain, we speak about tensions. Then we have the level of analysis. Once again, it's tensions and pressures. For instance, for psychology, it's post-trauma, okay? Shell shock, popping resources. And then you have the response. Even the response is termed, okay, <coughs> through the same prism. It's once again stress and tension prevention. This is how they call it, okay? And then you have some therapeutic strategies for prevention of stress and resilience maintenance. This is the wide range of the concept. Now, but if I want something which is not only in the psyche, okay? And maybe I want some new horizons because when you say the psyche, we will see now the implications that I saw. So, first of all, insufficient in understanding the military resilience. Why? The concept of stress has been too greatly stretched to cover resilience as a holistic dilemma. Okay, now the resilience of the army, this is what I want. This is my normative way. I come to tackle a problem. I can't say I don't care about the military. I mean, and it's not about being left or right. Please don't misunderstand that. <laughs> don't tell, because I was in a forum and they thought I was, I belong to a certain, and I'm not. I'm just telling you what I found. Okay, so the resilience of the army. This is the normative aspect I want, okay? 
it's in its perf is a performance value and a structural that means the model which i would like to talk about it the functional because models are structures that affect function okay mental level also derived from the nature of the qualities of each military organization that means i'm going to apply one tool to different to different states to different entities but my conclusion will be actually redefine the same concept of resilience to these different entities that i'm going to introduce i'm going to talk about now all resilience and this is what i was against it when i saw so much psychology and so much psychiatry and i know the power of these two disciplines okay i think they are more powerful than legal and uh, <laughs> I think so, and I have something naturally against these two these two uh, disciplines. I saw that when a soldier collapse, he becomes a pathological case. Okay, but I want something else. I don't know. I am concerned about the regular military who is still there, who is still functioning. Okay, and. Even when he disobeys, okay, it's not being under pressure or stress. But sometimes we do things, we do things on purpose, fully conscious and rational. And we also solve dissonance, <laughs> mental dissonance that the military sometimes create intentionally and I, I, and rationally and this is why i say all resilience whether human biological and organizational may be harmed consciously and rationally you don't have to need, you don't need post traumatic stress disorder to point or to say we have a blow to resilience because if i see that my expectations do not correspond to the reality in the military, and I refuse to do something, I'm not necessarily under a post-traumatic disorder. Okay? Now, it's more than that. It goes also, it, it, it's, it, it, it's, beyond, it's beyond that. It means that the military, unlike all organizations, doesn't allow the individual also to solve the mental dissonance. I don't know if you know the concept from Festinger. Okay? Festinger said that we will always have a mental dissonance when our expectations, ideas, beliefs do not correspond with reality. So we have several ways of decisions, okay, that can solve that kind of discrepancy but the military you don't have that freedom and this is one unique aspect of each military you cannot solve your dissonance or your mental dissonance through free choice like Festinger you know wanted to sort of develop you have limitations so the disruption is not a result of stress but rather a rational calculation resulting from the non-congruence between beliefs, ideas, or values. Okay, now going, and this is what I propose, I'd like to go out from the therapeutic strategies, okay, to crisis management cycle. I like this cycle. And then in order to say that, we know that psychological and psychiatric research, as I said, are for the most part relate to fighters who usually no longer belong, okay, to the warfare forces. The second one is the operative definition. I'm going to work with that definition. is based on the assumption that discussion of military resilience in a low-intensity conflict bears a normative value, which is a challenge to military resilience in low intensity conflict might evoke a challenge to management of reasons in a large scale warfare. Okay, and this is the normative aspect. I'm sorry it's about military, but also even when you speak about the military, we have some normative demands. 
So I want, I think that once you have a blow, like what I found in the second Intifada, it affected 2006 war in Lebanon. Though it were two different episodes, okay? Now, any discussion on resilience has an implicit demand, okay, for continued proper and stable functioning of the military, yeah? This is the essence of resilience against the backdrop of environmental and temporal challenges. This essence must be kept, must be expressed in the definition. And then I hope you will accept, uh, and it, it has a great, I think, relevance to Minerva Center, is like from prevention, I mean, when I say all resilience requires a holistic crisis strategy management cycle that goes from prevention, mitigation measures, okay, to preparedness, response, and rehabilitation. Even this term gets this crisis management cycle. Uh, okay, now the definition. <laughs> uh, for saying that I did preserve the psychological element, somehow, of course, but a damage to resilience is not necessarily a mental crisis. So what is the definition I proposed, okay, with great limitation is a measure, I speak about a measure of stability in the effective implementation of missions over time. I will elaborate each concept. I'll go while maintaining what? The following clusters. The first one, the building of force. The second one, a unit resilience. The third one, the military framework. The fourth, significance in the realm of the military spirit and the significance in the realm of the operational fitness. These are clusters. So I want to say something about two concepts I put in. What do I mean by missions? Missions, I mean immediate missions and long range missions. The second one is the measure of stability of effective implementation. It should always go along and correspond with the political rank. Of course, and here I'm always telling you about the third variable that I'm going to use, the natural tensions and conflictual situations between the political rank and the military rank all over the world, not only in Israel. So um, this is the first cluster. So what I, what I try to do here is to find only for the military, okay, its resilient profile, its resilient variables. It's only for the military. It's not. It can't be for social, uh, for society. It can. It cannot go for national resilience because we have these so many uh, uh, types of resilience. It cannot go to critical infrastructure resilience. It is tailored only for the military corpus, and not only for the military corpus. In the for the military corpus in a specific situation like low intensity conflict, we have to be that accurate. Now, the first one is the building of force. What is it? It's about the extent of fitness, training, quality of units and training. The second, capability of long-term preparation. Third, the ability to utilize resources and strength building abilities by the units. And the other, the framework of the training, utilization of professional expertise. Now, when we take this, and we go to these four conflicts, low intensity conflicts, it's amazing. Because I did so documents, once again, not interpretation of what has been written. I always like the original sources. Okay, I know that we might have sometimes, for instance, when you take autobiographies in these kind of, uh, of, of, uh, of conflicts, you have a problem because what is an autobiography? Someone wants to perpetuate his uh, grandeur or whatever, right? So you have to take several autobiographies that deal with the same 
event in order to go to, go to the common denominator. So it's a lot of work. Okay, so this is the first cluster. The second one is the unit resilience. What is a unit resilience? I'll just give to one or two. The ability to maintain the organic framework in a way which either harms or maintains the identification and the internal cohesion. So also, in Ireland, a blow, a serious blow to this, uh, for instance, this complement, okay? In France, <coughs> after when the, the goal declares, uh, mes chers amis, my dear friends, choose what you want, sovereignty, autonomy, while the battle is actually reaching its the end. It was a decisive battle. And it didn't, it didn't go there because the goal decided to stop it. And then you have a putsch, okay? And then people are sent, a senior rank is sent to France to possibly assassin all the leadership there. Okay, so of course, so we understand. Uh, this is only one military framework, of course. Uh, you have the ability to carry out the orders. Do you have, you give the, the order. Do you have the ability to carry out? <coughs> Do you have the procedure of a professional army to carry out the orders? So, and, and, and uh, just, I'll go, no, I'll go to the fourth one. Uh, expression of fear, anxiety. This is the significance in the realm of military spirit. For instance, when French corpus arrives to Algeria, and there is these patrols, okay? And someone documents the way they talk, when people talk, they speak while patrolling. Okay, so you have all these questions about the significance. What are we doing here? For instance, you have this question. Okay. Then you have the assembling candidates for officer positions. The last one, the significance in the realm of operational fitness. For instance, Israel, okay? The routine in Gaza brought her to adapt the same conception of warfare in the northern afterwards in 2006, in the beginning, the first days, okay, which was really a failure. Israel didn't understand that actually it is facing a new arena, okay, completely, a new scene. So it's about this, about the significance <coughs> in the realm of operational fitness. Now, I did this. I wanted to determine what kind of damage each cluster. So I decided to, if I see, if I detect that I have a damage to one element or more than one in two clusters, I will have a great damage. And with light damage is when I see that only one in one cluster. Why? Because of the theory on compensatory capabilities when there is disaster. Okay? Because even the body, when it suffers a trauma, he has different accessories for comp compensation. Okay? So it's the same thing. What I saw is great linkages between them. I cannot go right now through that. And I saw that as long as you keep the idea of having some compensatory capabilities and you plan them, and those compensatory capabilities might help you in different type of crises, you are insured in many ways, in many aspects. So the concept of a compensatory, accessory, etc., is in here. Okay, I won't, I won't go to that, but this is the rationale of it. So these are the three variables that I proposed. One is the military model. And when I said the military model, it encompasses actually three different epochs. I want to see how different model of military, okay, from the modern one to the postmodern military, affect resilience. My hypothesis was the most the military has a postmodern, and I will explain what I mean by that in just a second. I'm just doing some preparatory uh, <laughs> introduction to that. The more we see that the military model belongs to postmodern characteristic, the more it dangers, it endangers resilience. So, what is a military model? And then we see the warfare strategy. 
I chose the warfare strategy. It reflects maximal components of a low intensity conflict and allows to trace warfare transformation. And of course, the, milit the political military relations that aims at basic conventions suitable to all political systems at war. This is why I chose this, uh, this three. Uh, um, it is a trilogy of paradoxes. What, why, why is it a paradox? Because what I expect, when we, when we will see, for instance, when we will see the military model, we will see that the post-military model has great, uh, uh, great advantages. And then we see that actually it is a risky model to resilience in military, in, in low intensity conflicts. So what is that kind of model, okay? The second one is the warfare strategy. This is, the, this is my hypothesis. The farther warfare strategy is from the army's defined mission and from formal military warfare training, the greater the damage will get. And then we had the relations between the political military ranks variable that tells us if we have a lack of consensus on the goals and on the means of the management of a low intensity conflict, we will have a damage to military resilience. My findings were that even when we only have a disagreement on the, on the means, we already have a heavy damage to resilience. Not only, don't speak about the goals, but the means, okay? So I'll go now to what I call why a military model is relevant. So I took this table, it belongs to Moscos, uh, also uh, funded in military studies. And look at the variables I checked. I have the, uh, the perceived yes, uh, threat. I, I can't see my, my uh, okay, the threat perception. Okay, and then I have the major mission definition. I see nothing. I just try to remember what I wrote. Is it possible to enlarge it? No. Okay. The third one is the public attitude towards the military. And then we have the media military relations. This is the variables that actually changes from the end of the Second World War until the collapse of the, US, of the USSR. Okay. We have also conscientious objection, which is also a variable. The force structure, a very interesting one, okay? And the dominant military profession. These are the variables that I took and I checked, tried to detect them in every conflict. Let's go to the first one. The first one, I think I shall go there if you if you have any, because I really don't know. Try to do it from here. Oh, now it's better. Now, what I say is that the postmodern one, this one, okay, is the one that damages, that has great damage on military resilience. This one, okay. This one is dead from 90, uh, 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 1,090 from the end of the, to the end of the war. The threat perception here was enemy invasion. In the late modern time, we have a nuclear war. It's a formula. And here we have the subnational and non-military threat perceptions. Where do I take them from? I take them from the white papers of these entities. Russia, okay, of Israel doctrine, of Britain white papers, okay, and of course Britain. So you have them there. You will always have the perceived threats and the means to achieve your interests. The second one is, what is the major mission, uh, mission definition? Here, okay, it was, of course, defending homelands, two world wars. In the Cold Era, support of alliances, because strategic alliances becomes very relevant. Okay? And then you have here the new missions, peacekeeping and humanitarian. So why such a model should pose a challenge to military resilience? If we know that this major mission is Peacekeeping and humanitarian. Uh, the third variable is here yeah, the public attitude store military was supporting, very supporting. And here 
it's quoted and it's much more. Sometimes there are some few antagonisms between the two. Here we have the conciliations, uh, conciliations objection service. Limited or prohibited. And here in the postmodern, we have we know that it's a field under civil rights. There's, I think there were some dramatic uh, findings concerning Yeltsin uh, uh, political uh, uh, period. The fourth structure, mass army conscription. The postmodern, small professional military. So why? This is what. This is the, what, what is the paradox? I expected that once I see all these variables, maybe I would say that such a model, okay, might not necessarily damage military resilience. Okay, why should it damage? Is it? it sounds I call a soft power model. Okay, so why? And that's a paradox. This is one one paradox. The second paradox is the warfare strategy. Now, is it okay now I just, just to see what is a postmodern military? It's, or it's, it's a total course on, the, on these uh, concepts. Or, uh, sorry that I'm just giving it in a very brief uh, description. So, now the other one is now what's the problem? Why is it? I will go there. To, I'll go there to from you. I'll operate it from here. Hmm? If you'll say I'll operate it from here. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, okay, why is it, why the postmodern military endangers? If you look at its variables and you see the interactions between the different variables, you will understand why it is, why it, why it endangers or it risks or it challenges, maybe this is the word, military resilience. Threat perception that we saw there that is based on subnational, it is a subnational threat. A non-military threat whose, whose structural dimension is based on the concept of an advanced technology professional army, it is a gap between the perception of the threat and the military traditional training mission. That means when we look at the variables, they reveal okay, the absurdity when you want to lead or do a combat or manage a law conflict, you will see these contradictions. The second one is when you manage some national threat, you actually are inconsistent with the force structure. Look at the force structure, what, what, how it is defined there. That means based on an advanced technology and specialization. Okay. Third, requires constant dynamic adaptation of the military structure to threat perception. I don't like the word adaptation. I know it's always a very good, a very nice word because it's a very demanding process. Adaptation, if it has, if it has a long duration, okay, it erodes capabilities. So when you have a prolonged adaptation, you erode the building of force, the unit resilience, all the clusters I've already introduced. So adaptation is good when it's a short, but when it's a whole reality, it's a problem. Wow. This is one, uh, one, yes, thank you. Now, even when you care and you go for tailored technology, okay, should not be taken for granted. Even when you say, okay, now I have these new devices and so on. Why? Because Targeted technological development possess an ad hoc characteristic, and we know that it always we have business consideration and regulation, and we have some problems, especially cyber evokes this, this problem greatly. Ranges from technology to identify suspicious military objects, like in Israel also, to the abilities to neutralize explosive or explosive laden individuals. We know that non-lethal weapons are limited to specific situations, and I won't go into that, but we see that the analysis of asymmetry profile actually emphasizes the limitation of force structure based on an advanced military technological sophistication. We were, we were quite trapped. Okay. Uh, the second, the, yes, I think it was before, just 
What I call is the postmodern military, though sounds very friendly, is really not friendly to military resilience in managing a low intensity conflict. Why? Erosion factors, exhaustive duration of low conflicts, support from the public, it, we have indifference in public attitudes. Society is very critical. You have, it's not a one episode, uh, episode conflict. So when you see in the postmodern military that the relationship between the media and the society becomes ambivalent, critical, and much more than that, so you don't have a real friendly environment, okay? The second way, challenges on social resources, national resilience, okay? Weak environmental support. You have, of course, the critical media that what we can do are no longer communication mobilized, as it was in the beginning of, uh, of the state, or national goals are given to maneuver. And of course, the conciliation is objection service that might impact combatants. What I saw was a tremendous finding, I must say it here. When you have this conscientious objection before you join the army, you don't find serious problems. But when you come with great enthusiasm, to the army, and then you have that type of mental dissonance, this conscientious objecting is contaminant, is dangerous. And that means, should we respect, even in a selective way, a conscientious objection before a person joins the army? As a strategic, not just because it's normative and good, an ideal. Thinking strategically, do I want a soldier that tells me I'm a pacifist or something like that, really? Or the other thing, it's when someone comes really with such an enthusiasm, fighter, they are poisoned, I don't know, there is a word in Hebrew, and then sometimes there is some kind of a collapse, internal collapse, and I met such a student, such a, such a soldiers when I was in this IDF department. So I see it as more dangerous, okay? So these are the components of the post-military model that affects resilience. I will go to warfare strategy and you will see. The geographical conflict in warfare strategy has unique, unique aspects. Characterized, of course, blurred borders, okay? The front line is indistinct not applicable, a real non-normal situation. The other one is fluidity of close contact. And then we have the emphasis on the human factor. Professionalism as opposed to non-professionalism. These, these are the characteristics of the scene, of the warfare, of the battle, of such, uh, of such uh, conflicts. That means and of course, asymmetry in the coping methods. That means we have a mixed warfare strategy, terror tactics against a force whose power is a conventional level, using sophisticated means or warfare management that enable an overwhelming power, strategic maneuverability, and wide tactical mobility. What does it mean? It means a very, it has a very bad conclusion. If I say that this type of warfare affects military resilience badly, that means the vice versa. That means the more you utilize conventional warfare, okay, you rehabilitate your military resilience. And that's fine, I didn't like this finding. Didn't like it. But something calmed my mind, I should say. And I saw it only when I noticed the evolution, the evolution of the conflict itself that went from a terrorist to some semi-institutionalized state, okay, or semi-military organization. Then I could say that. Because in strategic, I mean strategically thinking, when you come to that, when you go to that evolution from terrorism to a semi-state, to semi-entity, uh, recognized by diplomatically and so on, 
you are actually facing, uh, I should say, um, a window uh, of hope. Because then tremendous things become relevant, like the concept of deterrence. So once again, strategically speaking, when an actor reduces its asymmetry, and they keep on doing that all the time, look at the different scenes and zones in Israel, okay? Look at the Hamas capabilities today, and look at Hezbollah capabilities today. For instance, for Israel, Hezbollah is identified with Lebanon. At least the next one will be a full-scale warfare. In strategic terms, it won't be a warfare, we call it pinzetta, selective and selective warfare. Okay, why? Because of this evolution. So, this is why Israel says, I'm, I don't care about responsibility is Lebanon. Why? In order to shift the type of warfare to the conventional classical warfare. Now, what it is good about it is when we bring into the table between the opponents the concept of deterrence. Because when you have a terrorist groups, of course, from lunars and so on, deterrence is irrelevant. When deterrence, it becomes, it is a sort of deterrence, we call it deterrence to negation. I mean, whatever you have achieved, I threaten what you have achieved. That's not the classical deterrence. Deterrence is when you have similar, somehow, capabilities, okay, relatively similar capabilities, then we can talk about deterrence. And deterrence is the beginning of the maturation state of a conflict. Okay? Though it is a military concept, it has a great value. Really, I cannot go right now into details in order to understand why deterrence actually announces the stage of a conflict management, whoever knows these terms in international relations, or a conflict resolution. Okay, it's two different phases. So, this is where I'm getting to. Oh. Yes, a warfare strategy, as I said, mainly dominated by expressive rather than instrumental methods. In the, in the theory of strategy, we have these two aspects, the instrumental and expressive. The more closer you are to your opponent, you are actually adopting an expressive uh, strategy. Okay? The more, if you are far away, okay, you're remote, or whatever, you are in Washington and you push the button in Afghanistan, we call it instrumental. Okay, so it's just, just for the sake of this. So we have the expressive, we have the presence, the presence in a civilian arena, emphasis on human factors, I said, fighting at close. Etc. These create a blurring in the identity of the soldier citizen, mental dissonance, challenging the areas of corpse spirit, and so on. So let's go maybe to five some. Uh, how much? Five? Maybe we can discuss it because it's not. Uh, Twenty minutes for discussion. How much? Twenty minutes for discussion. Oh yes. So another five minutes just to say about this. Is it okay? We can already talk, or you can ask me about the findings, and we can already open a discussion if you want. I'm sorry, it's, uh, uh, yeah, when the findings were really dramatic, I must say that. Okay. What were the findings? <laughs> the findings were, they gave clear dominance to the effects of the relations between political and military ranks on the impact on the, on, on, on the military corpus. They affected, they had a tremendous effect on the regular rather than on the senior. But when the senior was damaged, when the military resilience in the senior rank level was damaged, it damaged also the, the one who were under, uh, under the orders. Okay. So, okay, so that, but that was, it crossed all over them. It was all in all of them. In Russia, Yeltsin, first I think it was, he drank, I mean, you know, I don't know if he drank this, this type of whiskey, but he drank and he was somehow, <laughs> and he gave an ultimatum to the, Tech, the Chechenian and then he changed his mind. He gave an ultimatum for 
24, I can't remember, 24, 48 hours. And he said, you know what, come on, we're not going to keep that, let's go. But he forgot that the senior rank he brought to Grozny were actually comrades, friends with the Chechen that actually gave, got the same training in Russia before Russia collapsed. Okay, there was, there was a lot of turbulence in, uh, I call it. Of course, the French, I told you, the British. British was tremendous also. They really, it, it affected them very much. Because in the beginning was no use of fire. They put police forces in order to give it a neutral, uh, something like order, to bring order to Belfast. Okay? Then we had this bloody Sunday. And after the bloody Sunday, there was no one knew who is the enemy. Why? Because we know that British and Ireland share tremendous similarities, culture, music, and so on. And as long as fire was not allowed, they made this relationship. Okay? They became friends, they tried to help schools, they tried to help uh, these home cares, they went together for to pubs and so on. But when the order came, they didn't, they didn't know actually what to do. And then they did something what I call virtual. They took these barrels, beer barrels, and they faced, they put a sort of, uh, um, how do you call it, a fence. This is a very interesting, I think, finding that I saw in most of, the, of these uh, conflicts. Putting a fence between me and them. And that, that's how they started to create an artificial deterrence to know who is against me and who is for me. So very dynamic uh, scenes of battles, uh, these four cases. Warfare strategy, as I told you. Soldiers, when they saw that their friends, when they saw that their efforts were in vain, when they changed into a proper, what I call, conventional battlefield, you see that the rehabilitation of the resilience. The military model has tremendous effects. In French, especially, I saw it a great, uh, great, uh, uh, great uh, impact on the French uh, uh, military resilience. And the last thing that was interesting about the, the relationship between uh, the military and political is that when you come to rehabilitate, they have also a great role in it. When you come to rehabilitate, okay? So uh, to rehabilitate, of course, the concept of military resilience. Any other questions? Or no? just, just a very quick follow-up question about the point of, you know, when you talked about how the scene ranking officers resilient collapsed because of the you mentioned the term of a political military something. What what, what is the military relations? Uh, okay. Relations between them. Okay. Uh, but, but, uh, you raise a very good point which I would like to elaborate. In the postmodern era, the profile of the military rank is no longer that we knew we knew before. We have a professional profile. You have sometimes statesmen. You have these high ranks with diplomatic capabilities because of all the tasks they do overseas. They have a great knowledge of, uh, of languages, culture. Some of them, <coughs> they have already their PhD. Now they come to politi politicians, okay? And this type of conflict, unlike other conflicts, actually they constantly meet each other. And that's where tension and friction raises. Because this colonel comes, sees the politician, he actually professionally knows much more than him. So he can tell you, what well, does he understand this one? Okay, it, it goes along. Here in Israel, it's a very, uh, very uh, popular saying. He knows nothing. Why we say that? Because he became a professional colonel, a scholar colonel. I mean, we, this, is, this is the new profiles of the higher military ranks all over the world. 
for instance, you see the corpus, the Russian corpus in Syria now. Okay, it's not only the technician combatant, no longer that. So the more they are professionalized, the more they have divergent skills, different skills, the more friction, the more tensions. And they meet on a very, almost on a daily basis because this type of conflicts necessitates, needs, okay, more meetings between these two ranks than in just the normal situations and so on. That's a good point. Please, please. I wonder whether it's not more dependent on the situation uh, than you depicted. You said the four conflict was very much the same. But if I, you know, it's not identical, but consider the counterinsurgency strategy by the Americans in Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. In Iraq, it worked quite well. Mm -hmm. In Afghanistan, it worked, didn't work at all. So to what extent is, you know, the reaction and of the opposing side determining whether your factors work or not? My, I think my demarcation line is, are we sure that the Iraq conflict is over? Uh, my opinion is that it was not. Why? For a conflict such as the Iraqi, okay, especially that one, and I very, very much for me to stick to the speciality of the, of the Iraqi one. The post-conflict measures the post-conflict strategy that was needed was not implemented because Obama took the forces out. That means we had a conflict, we had a war, as you said, it seemed to succeed, and then we started this political stabilization, the United States, of course, okay, preferring this, preferring what, but it was the beginning. But instead of giving it a maturation, instead of following it, of supporting it, Obama, because of a specific agenda, uh, written agenda, Obama, he also said United States first, but in a different way than Trump, okay? He didn't support what we call the post-conflict period, which is we know that it is a critical phase today, especially when you do these interventions, that you cannot only finish or resume war. You need to stay there, okay, and see because it's about a process. The way I see it, it is not over yet. So, in what means? There was some kind of a decisive uh, war, but the results were not translated into political interests, which is a very, usually a very long process. So, this is, this is my demarcation line. Any other questions? Please. Can I ask something about what you mentioned earlier about consensus objectives and how mm. actually you might demoralize the army if you have people who don't want to do that anymore? <laughs> how do you address that? Because if you actually give the option to people to not enlist with the army, then you don't have an army anymore. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> For instance, in the second intifada, there was this group, okay, uh, several groups, uh, you know, about the letter of the Shminist and so on. But there, were, there were several groups that disobeyed orders. And after that, and after that, of course, yeah, the Shminist order. Order. Okay, never mind. Okay, never mind. The second intifada challenged, okay, the will of several fighters to fight in the same enthusiasm. Let's put it this way, okay? Yeah, exactly. Now we're talking about Israeli soldiers, right? Fighting. Not only that. Even in France, it was the same case. Okay. okay? And they come to Algiers full of uh, enthusiasm to help the nation with patriotic uh, 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 really feelings and need to sacrifice. But then they see several things. It's not always the same thing, okay? Sometimes they want more fighting. Sometimes they want less. So it's not exactly one type of people. These are what I say, this is the, contam they contaminate the spirit 
indeed, and the cohesion of the military group. And it, it, this is what I saw. On the other hand, when you somehow accept in a selective way the conscientious objection, I think, it is the state power to give it, to give you that kind of, of, of privilege, right? So it is, it, it is something that you acknowledge. The other thing, if you come to the military and then say, no, I don't want to be here anymore, it means that you are challenging okay, the military because of a misconduct. It's two different sayings. Okay, it's two different sayings. So this is why it is more, as I saw it, it was much more affecting because they were talking together. And, and some of them, I, I, uh, for instance, in the French, I'm going to, to, uh, to commit suicide or something. If they won't let me go back home, I'm going to sort of. And when they came back home, so it was written on several, uh, the, the society, most of the society, because of the, 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 the effects of Jean-Paul Sartre, Camus, there were two great uh, intellectuals that followed in a very critical way the, 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 the FLN, I mean, the, the Algerian uh, uh, insurgency. So they came, so you, you could see on the restaurant, no dogs and, 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 and soldiers are allowed. <laughs> Okay, so they go back to the to Algeria and they come with it. So of course it has a great. Uh, it uh, it's better for someone to have some kind of a di dialogue with a, so a soldier or with a person that doesn't want to join the army. Once again, it should be under a specific policy. I don't. Know, I can think of several things, but instead of and, and the other one is much more. That means keeping the resilience of the combatants is is a great challenge. Okay, then just accepting the fact that some might not really want to join the, the military here some not only here many in many places this thing is mixed you don't see that this is we speak about two different uh, two different things i assume that this study was done where you define military the state raised armed forces because you said most of the uh, information that we have that we have derived at are direct sources like white papers or something so what 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 would be the scenario when it is studied from the other side of the spectrum for example the dissident forces for example what about the uh, in, in Palestine in those in people that are guys or in yeah well you're touching uh, mm -hmm. and are they do you consider them military forces do you call them military forces or you just call them band of uh, um, yeah. gangs we never call that call anyone band i always like to use the concept of a non-state actor yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah professionally I, mean. I prefer it uh, and, uh, to do that um things have changed i follow these uh, insights today we are in a totally different situation and i can tell you for example daesh mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Daesh is very interesting because Daesh is unique compared to all terrorist groups that we have seen now. It is an organization that started as a state. Mm. Okay? What I said here is that we have several organizations, terrorists evolving from uh, evasive and elusive entities to delineated, defined geographical borders and becoming semi and so on. Daesh is not the same. And this is why, and some, and, and there, are, there are of course other, other reasons. We have a new, what I call profile. Before that, we had virtual terrorism, mm -hmm. Al-Qaeda, okay? I have two conclusions that can maybe, or not conclusions, I'm sorry, but maybe two things that we can look at them and probably in, in, uh, discuss and uh, maybe put some research. How do I see these people? I have a problem with the universal uh, concept of uh, human rights. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why I see its failures all over, because it deals with security, which is the most relative, okay, concept that we know 
in human reality. So why relative and universal and universal and we have this universal concept of the human rights, okay? And then I want to say, no, I cannot accept them. I would like to propose a relative concept. Relative to what? Relative to the national security defined by entities. We don't have one definition of national security. <laughs> okay, not only that, when you come and open the concept of security and you don't focus only on the military, which actually always goes with the notion of that, uh, you will see different clusters. All clusters of security are about human rights. If I may politely so, yes. uh, interject, uh, I, I understand your, uh, your uh, inference, I would say, but I, I'm having a hard time to, you, are you suggesting that the universal declaration, which yeah. which is not of in the sense of fundamental rights that you claim it against the state. What I understand from the universal declaration is that it says that since you're a human mm -hmm. and you have certain uh, virtues of freedoms that you must exercise irrespective of the system, legal system of which you're a part. But if you're suggesting that if we derive the concept of human rights relatively from uh, the perspective of various legal systems, for example, if you're living in Saudi Arabia or in Iran or you're living in Turkey or in India and everyone has their own concept based on the threat perception of the survival of the security of the state or maybe state get transformed into the, the, the idea of, uh, of a military becomes the state because I was reading a paper where it says when you say state interest, it really depends. If there is an administrative officer, yes, he sees interest in the terms of administration. Mm -hmm. If there is a military officer, he sees interest in terms of military. So if the state is governed by military, then their idea of human rights would be extremely yeah. narrow. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I want to make a clarification. Human is a reduction of the reality. It's a reduction of what is human. When you say human, you think you enlarge the concept, but actually you reduce it. And what I meant is not interests. For instance, I can give you an example. If I take definitions once again of national security, so we have these minimal definitions. Uh, sometimes you will see existential threat. Mm -hmm. Okay, the mere existence of an entity. It will not be the definition for France. It will not be the definition for, uh, for Russia. On the other hand, in Israel, most, there is a consensus, not necessarily, okay, that will tell you that we are still, we are still, we can still be defined, or we can define our national security as having existential threats. That means geopolitically and geostrategically, you cannot have one definition to different entities. I know that in Israel, some of them would say, oh no, we are no longer there. We will go to this peace settlement through the, through the status of power. We became so and so. So I know that there is. Now it's true, but the other also has to recognize it. it is, it's not enough. It's like an identity. It's not enough that Israel recognizes or claims, okay, its uh, security concern in terms of existential threat. You need also a consensus on that. I mean, a worldwide consensus, an international consensus. And indeed, many times you will see in the diplomatic area, and I put it into brackets, which is not actually the real, uh, the real uh, uh, stage of politics, you will see many times, many nations, foreign ministers, first declaration, we acknowledge the right da, 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 existence. You cannot, you will not be able to talk like this to many entities, which are hundreds of years geostrategically uh, 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 stable. I come to a different question, which is a very hard conclusion. Okay. When I say, universal the universal first of all you will see that there is a great tension security evokes great tension within those rights that means there is no such a thing as even the rights themselves when you put them when you speak about security 
in its wider conceptual framework, not in military, okay, when you speak about disaster, economy, environmental, social, political threats, and so on, which is not only, uh, sometimes I, I speak with my uh, 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 students about uh, the connection with, uh, of, uh, of animals, okay, that uh, are no longer here, and war. I hope so <laughs> the idea of students are sometimes they don't understand exactly. What I mean, if you enlarge, if you take the 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 the, the, uh, the larger de definition of security, you will see that the universal concept will always gain failures, and it is a politicized uh, today. It is a politicized international institution. Why? Because it is universal. All universal universal aspects are dimin diminishes the object of what they call, what they talk about. Because, as you put it, Saudi Arabs, okay, what type of rights they want? And in Sweden, what type of human rights? It's not the same thing. Okay? But the security so, debate is politicized as well. Well, everything, when I say something is politicized, even when desecurity, you, you make a desecuritization, it is when you, you ignore, for instance, you had so many attacks, terrorist attacks in Germany, in, 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 uh, in, in Europe. Now, you never had, no one declared, said, it's a terrorist Islamist. It took sometimes days, okay? So it is also a political agenda. I mean, when you securitize, it is a political agenda. When you desecuritize, it is a political agenda. How, shall, how do I know that? Narrative. I know it through the narrative, okay? Now, look at the narrative of the foreign relations and foreign, uh, um, foreign affairs of the EU. Okay, how it, it is a constructivist, you know, okay? constructivist in the, a very constant constructivist way, which today we see that there is a problem and uh, that it, uh, once again evokes the gaps between uh, Europe and 27. What I wanted to say about the, 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 the relative is harder. It's a lot of thinking, of work. You cannot have only... Um, low uh, experts you need other also experts to be in this in the in hug and so on so it is a challenge at the end of the challenge there is a hope that i can take my leadership to court i think that war is unjust but mm -hmm. in order to understand the process not an international organization will come and tell me this and that it's me to have now today cyber, which actually uh, does some great, I think, changes between the relationship of the power and the citizens, is actually exposing, is somehow, you know, promoting what I say. The time as a citizen, if I think that 2006, it's too late, right? Okay, I'm a, as a mother, whatever. I want to have that privilege to bring my leadership, okay, and give some responsibility. It will be stronger than having an international organization telling you that you are uh, actually violated uh, human rights law and so on. <laughs> but in order to understand that, there is a process, an analytical process going from one step to another. Yeah, I, I understand okay. your point because recently, if you read a book, uh, in in uh, Germany, uh, I, I read a book by a professor, Mr. Kirsch, if I'm not mistaken, his name, K-I-R-S-C-H. -E he wrote a book called Beyond Constitutionalism. And while reading that book, what I understood that he wanted the European Union to succeed and he found that the constitutional aspect of the governance has in fact become an impediment in this unification of Europe because so the right, right, uh, the, the nomenclature for his book should have been beyond nationalism, but he perhaps said nationalism is as good as constitutionalism, mm. which I think is not. Mm. But the same argument what I see here is coming, because if you see the declare, what I'm saying is that you write everything which is universal is not going to, because plurality is the essence of life, plurality is something which is core to the existence of any form of, of organic, uh, organic existence. But what is universal in that is not the uh, is not the uh, 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 the idea of a system. The universal is that every human being, irrespective of his, her 
geographical location needs basic, uh, basic what you call elements to survive in order to be termed as, uh, uh, for example, if certain society which believes that slavery is all right and if someone is not belonging to religion X, Y, Z, you can make them slaves and reduce them uh, as a chattel or a property and then trade them. That's not going to be accepted just because a regime believes that this is where divine mandate or it is something that, that the society must accept it. So that's what I'm saying, that universal declaration is not a systematic thing. It declares that a human has universal need. Sorry. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good note to finish at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.